So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, so many people, many new faces. Um, my name is uh, Rocco Pansira. Uh, I'm a geospatial health specialist in the UNICEF health section in New York. And I provide global coordination of UNICEF, morning. UNICEF programs. Good morning. Um, uh, related to geospatial health. Uh, just uh, again, a kind uh, asking everybody to uh, mute themselves since there's uh, many of us. Uh, on behalf of the WHO and UNICEF GIS Working Group, I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch. On behalf of the um, GIS Working Group, I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of the COVAX Geospatial Com Health Community of Practice. Uh, this initiative is jointly managed by WHO and UNICEF and supported by the Digital Health Center of Excellence, um, which is a UNICEF WHO multi-agency consortium that was created in 2020 to provide coordinated support to governments for deployment of digital technologies to support uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is the first of a series of monthly meetings, which we hope will provide a venue of knowledge exchange between a wide, wide variety of actors that are contributing in various ways to support uh, countries in deploying just special solutions for COVID-19. Sorry, I got muted by somebody. Uh, we have a dense agenda today. Uh, we will provide a very brief introduction to the COVAX GS Working Group and the scope of the uh, community of practice. We will then move to an exciting presentation from the Zambia Ministry of Health and Grid 3 team on the experience of application of GS for COVID-19 microplanning. And uh, time permitting, there will be also an announcement of the upcoming COVID-19 delivery support uh, funding opportunities, the CDS. We'll have two moments dedicated to a bit of audience engagement, a quick uh, interactive survey to get a better sense of who is on the call, uh, and a Q&A session after the uh, country use case presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are our speakers for today, in addition to myself. Uh, we are fortunate to have Constance Sakala Banda, uh, Acting API Manager from the Ministry of Health in Zambia, who will lead the country use case presentation with support from Chizenga Muzuka from the Grid 3 team. Uh, from WHO, we have Ravi Shankar, the head of the WHO GIS Center for Health, that we will start us off shortly and Ana Lucia Raposo. Uh, next slide, please. So without further ado, I hand it over to uh, Ravi Shankar, if he's here with us for a quick uh, welcome uh, from the GIS, COVAX GIS Working Group. I, I don't see Ravi now online. Maybe if you can wait 30 seconds and see if he joins. If not, um, either you, Hoko, or me can uh, um, sure. give a, a fast introduction. Uh, maybe I can just go ahead, Anna, if that's go okay. Ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, as, as many of you know, uh, the GIS Working Group, uh, the WHO UNICEF COVAX GIS Working Group um, was uh, uh, initiated uh, uh, around uh, in 2020 as a group of technical ec experts that are working at the intersection of geospatial data for vaccine delivery. Uh, the group of operators under the guidance of the COVAX Vaccine Delivery Innovation Group, which is now being rebranded as a, a COVAX uh, Vaccine Delivery uh, Partnership, and was brought together to really work collect collectively uh, on um, uh, 
coordinating global support uh, from donors, um, uh, linking with technical partners uh, in supporting the um, uh, WHO and UNICEF and implementing partners, um, uh, uh, strengthen the use of digital solutions and in particular just spatial uh, solution uh, for uh, the um, originally uh, for the objective of pandemic response and specifically the the COVAX mandate of uh, distribution and uh, delivery of vaccines. Um, uh, we have worked uh, with many of you um, for about a year and a half now, uh, um, mainly around the production of um, a global guidance um, for uh, planning, costing, and implementing uh, GIS-based um, micro-planning solutions of the delivery of vaccines through uh, last mile uh, micro-planning, which was one of the um, core areas of innovations that had been identified by the um, uh, COVAX uh, facility uh, as um, one of the core area where uh, GIS could have a, a substantial impact um, specifically around the identification of the new uh, target populations um, and uh, uh, the um, uh, optimization of uh, uh, service delivery uh, through the use of geospatial data uh, and, and, and GIS. Um, we're delighted to have you all here uh, and uh, uh, continue this uh, this work uh, through these uh, um, a new initiative, uh, Geospatial um, Health Community of Practice, um, which I will uh, uh, provide a bit of an introduction now, if we can move to uh, the next slide. So this initiative is an extension of a series of knowledge exchange uh, that was um, in um, meetings that was led by the GS Working Group, uh, which focused on uh, the existing uh, geospatial data uh, products, services, and platforms that are relevant to COVID-19 vaccine response. Uh, there are a few reasons behind uh, uh, the, the launch of this specific community of practice. Uh, the first of all is that uh, the the global global COVAX agenda is shifting, as some of you might know. Uh, the COVAX facility and therefore WHO, UNICEF, and other partners uh, that are implementing that mandate uh, is expanding from the focus on distribution and delivery of COVID-19 vaccines in the cost in the context of pandemic response. Uh, to thinking about the role of digital and geospatial uh, solutions uh, in the supporting the integration of COVID-19 vaccines and tools into routine immunization. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, the role in uh, promoting integrated uh, service delivery uh, from health facilities to communities uh, and also wider uh, primary health care uh, strengthening. We do believe, uh, as many of you probably uh, as, as well, that uh, geographic information system has a, um, a rather uh, strong uh, potential for uh, linking uh, uh, different uh, health programs uh, and, and, and in that way uh, allowing us to um, optimize uh, the delivery of primary healthcare services. So this, this shift uh, clearly means uh, the need to build on, on uh, what the work done until now uh, and, and expand our collective efforts to uh, adapt to this shift. Uh, and, and, and therefore, um, th this community practice has uh, one of, um, serves that as, a, as a, one of the main role. Uh, the second reason is that uh, we want to continue and ensure uh, value for the GS working group partners that are in the audience. 
and specifically by increasing the focus on the gaps and needs uh, experienced by health programs at country and global level that need to be addressed uh, through uh, existing or through optimization uh, of, of the solutions uh, to the specific needs. Uh, and we also want to provide uh, concrete pathways and opportunities for many of the uh, partners, uh, technical partners and, and, and others uh, to effectively engage with countries uh, and to effectively, effectively engage with donors uh, to uh, improve the uh, implementation at country level. Uh, next slide, please. So the objective of what we're trying to achieve today with this first meeting and um, the following ones is to serve as a value, value venue of knowledge exchange between the variety of actors in this space, uh, specifically country implementers, implementing partners, donors and providers of geospatial solutions to um, strengthen global coordination of technical assistance to countries related to the deployment of geospatial solutions to promote the alignment of the existing um, and new uh, geospatial services and solutions to the actual um, uh, data gaps and the operational needs exper experienced by health programs at country and global level and also to strengthen the alignment between the uh, technical services and solutions uh, to the, the strategies and principles that are promoted by UNICEF, WHO and partners uh, uh, when it comes to uh, digital uh, and geospatial uh, solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to achieve this, uh, this community of practice will, uh, with, with this community of practice, we hope to host uh, presentations and discussions related to a number of topic. Um, the main focus will be on country use cases um, to highlight successful implementation strategies, but also to highlight uh, challenges that are encountered in the translation of uh, geospatial technologies um, uh, and integration into uh, programs. Uh, we want to showcase information products produced by implementing partners such as guidance, toolkits uh, that are uh, crucial in the um, uh, effort by WHO and UNICEF at uh, a country level to deploy these solutions. Um, we'll host information about geospatial programs and strategies by implementing partners to uh, foster alignment and uh, funding opportunities relevant to geospatial health uh, and also some expert presentations on um, uh, global health challenges to help us drive, hoping that this uh, community of practice can drive uh, a little bit the, uh, the future direction of geospatial uh, health for uh, COVID-19 and beyond. And we also keep hosting uh, and presenting geospatial solutions demos. We we'll obviously, obviously won't do that all in one go, uh, but there will be a series of monthly meetings as I will explain later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, lastly, I wanted to touch on some of the principles that drive the support that is provided by WHO and UNICEF uh, for deployment of digital and geospatial solutions, as this will be, uh, will be underpinning uh, principles of the presentations and discussions that we're hoping to facilitate here. Um, uh, we work jointly with partners to ensure countries have access to geospatial solutions that are demand-driven, uh, that are sustainable uh, in terms of integration into the country operational workflow and the country digital ecosystem so that solutions are sensitive uh, uh, of those digital ecosystems. Uh, we encourage and promote the use of digital public goods standards uh, to ensure uh, country ownership, uh, replicability and adaptability of existing uh, solutions. And we also promote a special solution that can be later uh, expanded and integrated into the health management information systems. And in that sense, we work 
um, with a number of uh, um, uh, actors uh, in terms of promoting uh, defining standards uh, of interoperability and uh, promoting um, and supporting uh, solutions that are um, that comply or that are um, uh, in, in compliance with some of these um, uh, standards. Um, so these are kind of some of the principles um, that uh, we hope will um, uh, drive some of the discussions. Um, I will ask now uh, our Dev, Dev Global colleagues uh, to uh, take over and have a bit of a, a survey to um, um, just get a sense of who is on the call. Hey everyone, we're going to pop up uh, a Zoom based survey for you here real quick with just two simple questions in it. Uh, one is what is what organization do you belong to or, or sort of what type of organization are you representing today in the COP? And the second one is what's your role in geospatial health for COVID-19 and health programs in general? Uh, and then when everybody's had a chance to fill that out, we will uh, pop up some results for a quick share before we move on to the next item. Um, Jeff, are we giving like one, one minute to participants? Yep. And I expect that the outcome will appear over on the screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Suzanne will bring that up here in just one second. <clears throat> Okay, let's uh, close the survey there and bring up results. Okay, great. So just quickly, um, a good number of WHO colleagues uh, and UNICEF colleagues, um, private sector, uh, NGO, also academia, and uh, also happy to have uh, some representative from funding bodies. And um, also a percentage of uh, uh, representative from governments and ministries of health. Uh, that's, that's really great. Um, it's quite a varied um, audience and, uh, and also very happy to have um, uh, many from um, WHO and UNICEF uh, country and regional office side of things. And really the the, the, the beneficiaries of, uh, of, of the support that is provided uh, through this global, uh, global push. Um, uh, apologies for those that uh, are in the other category. Uh, maybe let us know uh, for the future uh, how, how we, we missed out on that. On that. Um, in terms of roles, uh, your role in geospatial health um, we have a vast majority of us uh, implementing health pro programs in countries. That's great. Um, also a good amount of software platform service uh, developers. Um, and um, uh, in, in, in minor representations, uh, other, um, some of the other categories. Uh, but really great to see a lot of uh, uh, people that works directly in country uh, for uh, implementation. So great, thank you for um, contributing to that. Um, we'll move over, I'll handing over now to um, our colleagues from Zambia um, that will present on the application of GIS for COVID-19 microplanning 
in the country. Uh, a quick reminder to the presenters that we'll have 20 minutes for the presentation, if we can uh, stay within that time as much as possible, uh, although I believe it would be very interesting and uh, engaging. And uh, to the audience, please, uh, we have a, a Q&A session following the presentation, so we invite you to hold your comments for them uh, or um, so that you, you can speak up later on. Thank you, and over to you, uh, to Zenga or Constance. Um, hello, Rocco. I'm just trying to confirm that you, everybody can hear me correctly. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear? All right, okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rocco, for the introduction. Um, I'm coming from grid three and uh, I'll be, um, we are honored to have the presence of uh, a government representative from the Child Health Unit, uh, Madam Constance uh, Banda, and she'll guide us through uh, several elements of the presentation. Next slide, please. So this is our agenda for uh, the presentation and uh, at this stage, I will hand it over to Madam Constance to guide us through the background and the challenges, and then I will be back with the special uh, data solutions. Uh, over to you, uh, Mrs. Banda. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stenga. I'll take um, um, the people on the call through the presentation today. So I'll start uh, first with the background. Okay, so um, Zambia uh, commenced implementation um, of COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. Constance, Constance, just sorry, one second. Could I please ask you your your voice come through a little bit uh, low in volume? Um, is there any chance you could increase or get close to the microphone? Okay, is that better now? Uh, not not really. Okay, is that any better? Okay. Hello. I, yes, a little bit better now. Okay. Um, I think I'll proceed with uh, the presentation. Um, I'd mentioned that um, um, Zambia began implementing the COVID-19 vaccinations in April of last year. And uh, we had set uh, to meet uh, the target of 70% uh, of our target population um, by June uh, 2022. And uh, this was uh, also preceded by uh, the various targets that we had. Uh, our first target was 10% uh, of our target population. And at the time, that was um, uh, people that were 18 years and above. And then uh, we had also a 40% target um, that was there for 31st of December, uh, 2022. We could move on to the next slide. Okay, so one of the major uh, components that we had struggled with, even as we were commencing with our COVID-19 vaccine deployment, was around the area of and um, uh, microplanning has um, five main components. I'm sure um, people on the call may be aware of them. We have the planning and management of resources, uh, the establishment of um, outreach services. Um, we have uh, linkage of services to the community, support provision, and then monitoring and using for action. So what had um, preceded or was part of the um, training process was that uh, firstly, we identified um, and prioritized the health facilities uh, for the microplanning templates. Uh, then we uh, conducted a um, quantitative analysis of the immunization data that we had available. So this was based on having the um, the total population as well as the target population by head count. So we took into consideration that data. 
data as well on the coverages that uh, we had um, available with us. Then we uh, identified the barriers and um, proposed solutions. And these barriers would um, be those barriers that um, affect access and also those that affect um, utilization. And by utilization, I mean uh, continuation of um, the services. So having the same recipients that we had uh, reached out uh, with the first doses being able to come through and take up uh, till they're fully uh, vaccinated. Um, what the process also involved was a preparation of their annual uh, plan, priority activities, and also having these um, work plans posted. And then uh, once we had these health facility micro plans um, available, they were then also consolidated through the district micro plans. So these were the main processes that um, we had uh, taken the participants through uh, during the process of the orientation. Next slide. So what you see there is uh, the template for the micro planning, that's the COVID-19 vaccination micro plan, uh, which we had adapted from the uh, routine immunization uh, red rec uh, micro planning templates. Next slide. What you see um, above is uh, the templates that now um, outline when we began engaging with um, grid three uh, in relation to the COVAX micro plan. So in uh, April 2020, um, grid three and uh, the Zambia. NSGI released core information of layers uh, through the Zambia hub data. So uh, the initial discussions of that engagement began in April uh, 2020. Then um, on the side of our engagement with COVAX, that um, application process uh, was done in December 2020. And uh, from December 2020, the country now began to make preparations, plan, develop um, a national immunization strategy. Um, and we received our first shipment of vaccines in April. So we received the first shipment on 12th April. And on 15th of April, we commenced our vaccination activity. And our target at the time was about 8.4 million. Our target was those who are 18 years and above. And then um, in September 2021, um, we had set ourselves a target uh, to fully reach 10% of our eligible population. And um, by the 31st of September, we had missed that target. So what I could outline as some of uh, the challenges that we are uh, noted during this period, and uh, these were informed by the interaction review that was done, was firstly, we had uh, limited vaccines that were available. And uh, we, also, we also had very few sites that were providing the service. But one of the major uh, bottlenecks that was there was that um, in most of the facilities, uh, we did not have um, the micro plan available. And so um, we began um, the micro planning um, maps review uh, with grid uh, somewhere around September uh, in efforts to try and see how we could address this challenge that we had also identified through the IAR. So in November, we had some geodata that was collected. And um, this geodata that was collected was also uh, used even as we were commencing these uh, micro planning trainings uh, that would uh, be started. So in December, another uh, target uh, that we had was to fully vaccinate the 40% uh, of our target population and we missed that target again. But even as we were working through these different uh, processes, um, we also uh, 
continued to see how we would use these trainings and um, uh, the rollout of these trainings to be able to help us have more defined plans and um, targets uh, to enable us to reach uh, closer to where we desired to be. So in February of uh, 2022, we, we started uh, these trainings. And then um, in May, uh, we had our first uh, national uh, coverage, our national campaign. And this was uh, conducted from uh, 13th to, to 31st of May, uh, where we managed to reach out and provide doses to about 2.5 million of the population, which was a very significant um, uh, difference from what we had seen uh, in the past when we did not have these microplans um, available with us. So in uh, June, the major um, activities there were around uh, the end of the phase one of the COVAX EPI uh, microplan workshops that we had with the prioritized um, districts and health facilities. And then we also had um, our target, which was to fully vaccinate 70% um, uh, of our population also missed. But uh, one positive thing was that uh, we saw ourselves closer, much closer at least to the target than before, in that we had attained uh, coverage of um, over 40% uh, by this um, uh, June uh, target. So um, where we are at now, uh, we've identified an additional um, 58 districts that will now implement the phase two of the, um, of the COVID-19 vaccination campaign. Next slide. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I've uh, highlighted, even as I've been discussing the challenges that we have faced, but additional to those are um, issues around um, vaccine hesitancy, issues of uh, high dropout rates, which uh, indicates uh, utilization issues, and the issue of slow and uh, low uptake of these vaccines, uh, a weak uh, uh, passive AFI system. And then in the initial, I'd mentioned that these microplans were not um, available. And so we saw that uh, the health facilities uh, were not uh, fully implementing the activity uh, to the way that we had desired and they were missing out um, a lot of um, our target population. Um, another um, challenge is the limited GIS capacity within the EPI team in general. Next slide. Okay, so at this point, I'll hand over to Tsenga to take over and then I'll come back later uh, to outline more about uh, lessons learned through the process. Over to you, Tsenga. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Banda. As uh, part of the, the challenges that were raised in the previous slide by uh, the, Mrs. Banda, we worked with EPI to uh, develop maps uh, for the training uh, program based on that uh, red rec or reach every district, reach every child uh, approach. And these maps were tethered to fit within the needs of EPI. As you can see there, that's one of the districts in Zambia, a district health uh, officer studying the map um, uh, map features. And we distributed for all the districts in Zambia. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of what went into the maps, we took in the, the key uh, layers such as the population infused settlement extents. We added uh, catchment boundaries that were developed by ACROSS. And we also added uh, administrative boundaries of the districts that we got from the Ministry of Lands uh, through the NSDI. And we also added core infrastructure layers such as uh, schools, uh, churches, and key points of interest 
as well as roads that um, health facilities where staff would be able to orient themselves uh, in the maps. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the outputs, the maps uh, were developed in two forms. We had the district level map, which you see before you. It's a map of uh, one of the districts in Zambia. And in the map, it's depicting all the catchment uh, boundaries uh, developed by ACROSS. And we had infused also our settlement extents, as Elias said. And we also added credits in the map in terms of the data sources and how it was generated. To the maps, we also added uh, population estimates. Uh, you see before you there, there were three key sources of population. The first one was based on the grid three uh, bottom up uh, estimates uh, model. The second was based on the ZAMSTAS, which is Zambia Statistics Agency's uh, official projections. And the last one was based on, the, um, it was empty, like you can see, because it was left for health facilities uh, staff to fill it in with their own head counts. So the population was broken down into the three main strategies of uh, mobile or fixed point rather, which is within five kilometers of a health facility. Um, and then we had uh, outreach, which was within five to 10 kilometer. And then we had uh, mobile, which was um, greater than uh, 10 kilometers. We also had uh, age breakdowns in the, in the maps that captured the ages 12 and above, but we also added aspects of other age bands that could make the map useful for other immunization uh, initiatives. Next slide, please. Going down on another level, we produced the maps for the catchment, uh, the health facilities themselves and where their catchment uh, boundaries passed. So for these maps, we added, uh, we used satellite imagery so that uh, health facility uh, staff would be able to orient themselves better and can see actual features on the ground within the distribution. As you can see, we also color coded the, the settlement extents so that you could uh, tell the reach within five kilometer in green, five to 10 in, ye in yellow, and uh, the last color to depict those settlements that were distributed uh, greater than 10 kilometers. We also added, added the population breakdown uh, in the same manner that we did in the uh, in the district maps. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the map distributions, the maps were distributed to the trainers in form of A0 maps for the district level. Uh, they were given out and then also sometimes sent out through courier services to the facility, to the training stations where grid three staffs were not uh, represented. Um, we also produced A4 uh, PDF catchment level maps that were smaller than the, the others, as you can see in the pictures that health facilities were able to uh, read out and also use to, to, uh, to inform their micro planning. By the end of the training, we were able to capture uh, with, together with EPI and other partners that supported this program, such as WHO, uh, you, um, CIDAS and AMREF, about uh, over 3,100 healthcare workers were trained and uh, cutting uh, that was cutting across 1,669 health facilities representing 71 districts from the 10 provinces of Zambia. The next slide, please. So uh, in terms of the, we had two types of maps based on the population uh, distribution between urban and rural areas. So we, as you can see in the two pictures on top, the first one is for urban and the other one was, uh, the, the urban one was based on the population density approach. And then the rural 
uh, districts was based on the catchment uh, boundaries, uh, the settlement extents. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of uh, further support to grid three, we are working with EPI to develop uh, an optimized uh, sites approach to, to inform the daily implementation plans uh, that uh, are being conducted by EPI in the COVID-19 uh, uh, campaign that uh, Madam Constance earlier mentioned. And um, uh, more work is and discussion is, is being uh, done on this um, to move forward with uh, an approach that would inform the healthcare workers where best they could place additional sites within their catchment. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, based on the previous slide, this is just a, a snapshot of the dashboard. That is the tool that we are working on with EPI to be able to inform the COVID-19 campaign that also depicts the additional population that can be reached based on setting up uh, a vaccination uh, station or center or site at a particular uh, location, which also informs what other key uh, infrastructure is within that radius, such as schools, um, churches, and key points of interest. So um, next slide, please. Thank you. At this point, I will call back Madam uh, Banda to uh, read, lead us through the outcomes and lessons learned. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll proceed with the outcomes and lessons learned. Okay, so since um, the start of the vaccination, um, we've uh, been implementing the three strategies that speak um, outreach and mobile, and uh, within um, consideration of the uh, distances as was shared earlier. What has been there as well uh, that we have uh, seen uh, with uh, the implementation of this um, grid three um, projects of uh, having the maps readily available is the ability of the, the health facility workers to now be able to clearly um, deline the areas where they uh, should be operating. So in such a way that uh, they're able to really map up uh, the, their catchments uh, very well and ensure that there are no populations that have been left um, that are within their catchment areas. We've also noted that um, with these optimized uh, sites that um, are presented, they are able to also um, have um, uh, improved resource allocation and prioritization of where um, exactly they should be um, putting more efforts or how they can spread across the limited resources. Then what has also been noted is that uh, through these maps, they've been able to also identify and previously missed communities. So in areas where um, they uh, were able to capture uh, certain numbers and having looked at uh, the different uh, um, estimates of uh, how many people are within those catchment areas, they've been able to still go back to those areas and also uh, see how best to reach uh, those missed uh, communities. Then um, a significant example uh, that we have noted was with one of the districts that we had started with uh, the rollout of this uh, micro plan in that uh, when we look at uh, the coverage that uh, was there for this uh, particular uh, district, and in this case, uh, Kafue, We've seen that uh, most of the districts where we rolled out uh, these uh, micro planning trainings, uh, we've seen a significant in the vaccination rates. Uh, next slide. The lessons learned uh, from the implementation. So looking back at the, the, the period before we rolled out the micro planning and looking back now, uh, what we have um, learned is that um, it's very important to have um, a planning baseline at the different health facilities. So having uh, these uh, micro planning 
uh, trainings provided to the different health facilities helps to them to have them really establish their baseline and then also have uh, this plan that they now roll out. Then uh, with, uh, the GI, with the GIS uh, capacity, we've uh, noted that um, when we have this available, uh, this capacity available, even at the district and also We might have missed, uh, we might have uh, lost Constance. Uh, am I, does anybody else hear her or is it only me? I'm not able to hear her. Okay. Oh, I can't, I can't hear her too. Um, maybe I could... Yes, if you can, and uh, maybe just kindly asking you for the sake of time, if we could uh, uh, go through the last few slides within a couple of minutes. Um, no know. problem. Great. Yes, just picking up on what, what she where she ended. Uh, the other challenge was also the integration of the maps. Um, and uh, for this, uh, we we have conducted several trainers, and as part of the technical support, we also would train the national EPI trainers in a training of trainers approach before going out uh, in the campaign. And then we also had a challenge of lack of hard copy facility level maps, as you could you saw in one of the pictures, there was a smaller map, but we didn't print those for all the districts uh, because of um, we, we made them as uh, soft copies in, in most cases because of the budget constraints. Then um, we had uh, challenges with some trainers not being able to efficiently explain the mapping component um and uh we to answer this we've been able to uh, provide additional support uh, to epi and extend uh, gis uh, capacity uh, strengthening uh engagements and and workshops so we've been enrolling people into uh, training programs with our partners um flowminder uh, next slide please uh, in terms of the remaining challenges, we have uh, recognized that there's limited institutional capacity for use of geospatial data, discrepancies beyond health facility uh, headcounts, bottom-up grid three estimates, as well as the uh, ZAMSTAS projections. Then uh, EPI does not have a designated and full-time GIS staff. Uh, which limits the staff availability uh, to be trained. So you find that even if they're trained, that does not really fall within the mandate. And then you have to um, to uh, realign uh, to um, to go to the constraints and, and and situation that is at hand. We also have a large number of facilities that require to be trained. So there's about uh, forty five. Uh, districts out of the 116 that are not yet trained in micro planning. Then further training is required also for uh, the human resource that come in into the Ministry of Health. So there's that constant change of personnel and we need to keep it up in terms of uh, that knowledge exchange. Next slide, please. So I think uh, we will just invite back Madam Costance to lead us through this one. She, she's back on the call now. Okay, thank you very much. And yeah, probably I just off the call. Okay, so beyond the COVID works, um, as a team, we've um, extended the use of these maps to the current door-to-door uh, -door polio campaign. So we have a WPV1 polio outbreak response that uh, is being conducted. And so far we've conducted three um, out of the four rounds with um, potential of additional rounds um, in the future for the outbreak response. So we've extended the use of the maps and digital tools to that um, outbreak response. We've also had uh, discussions even with the grid three team to expand our targets to include other age groups uh, to whom we are providing routine 
uh, vaccinations such as the HPV um, vaccination, where we're targeting 14 year old girls and plan to conduct a multi age cohort vaccination for next year and then dropping back to the nine year old girls. So these uh, targets have also been incorporated in the maps. And so uh, we plan to uh, use them as well for these routine immunizations. And then the other use for the maps beyond uh, COVID is around uh, the targeted campaigns and outbreak responses. I'd mentioned the polio campaign, but we've also had uh, some measles uh, outbreaks that have been recorded um, in the country. And so the maps are also being used for those. And then we've also had some um, oral cholera vaccination um, activities around um, the hotspots. And so the use of the maps has also been extended as well to those uh, campaigns. So these are the other areas that we have extended. Okay. Thank you very thank, much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Constance and Chizang. A great example. Uh, also great to see the, the impact uh, of EPI being able to uh, significantly increase the coverage within the, the six months of the of the implementation. Um, I will, we are slightly beyond behind time be too late. Uh, on our schedule, so we'll probably have uh, 10 minutes uh, for a uh, quick Q&A. Um, and then for uh, uh, those that are interested, we'll probably present the, the, um, the, the CDS uh, uh, funding opportunities in the five minutes past, for the five minutes past the hour. Apologies for that. Uh, so, um, Inviting now um, uh, colleagues that had the questions that maybe were not responded in the chats, if they would like to uh, 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 speak up and uh, introduce themselves and, uh, and and pose their questions for uh, the Zambia team. Nobody wants to start us off. Uh, there I, are some I had, people with us. Yeah, I, I had read the mic, raised my hand. Uh, oh, hi. Hi, Carolina. Hi, um, Carolina de Novaro with the Global Immunization Monitoring, Monitoring Team in WHO. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues from Zambia, for, the, <clears throat> for sharing the experience. You indicated that you had to adapt many things to, to include the these maps and, and the GIS use in your workflow and the processes. Two very specific questions is, what would you change in, for example, our guidance with red rec and in, in what WHO provides as, um, as things to do so we can improve it to incorporate um, the experience that you have? So that's question number one. And second, the limited capacity in EPI for GIS work. Uh, I wonder if uh, you think that including these skills in the people or providing support in these skills with through the STOP program would be of use. Thank you so much. Should we answer right away or should we collect the questions? I think considering the limited time, I would go ahead and respond. Okay, thanks. I think in terms of the um, red rec um, template, you know, th there's different ways to uh, model out distance and a lot in a lot of strategic plans, the ministries of health have distance in kilometers, um, which works okay. But if you have countries that are very, that have a lot of elevation, um, you could also think about like travel time. So how long does it take somebody to actually walk to the facility? Because in mountainous areas, it takes a lot longer to walk two kilometers than in a flat area, for example. So maybe changing um, the distance, if possible, sometimes it's not because of the strategic plan um, to, you know, accessibility in travel time um, may also be helpful. 
Um, I'm not, I guess I don't know enough about the STOP program uh, to be able to uh, answer that question. Maybe we would have to liaise offline. Start, yeah. Okay, I'll take on the question on the STOP program. I think that would be uh, helpful as well for the team, but then maybe just to also have um, some online courses, which also build uh, capacity in the national level uh, teams as well, would also be more sustainable as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think I see uh, Felix hands up and next Matt. Felix. Are you still with us? Okay, so I guess we'll move to Matt. Yeah, I also think Carolina had her hand up maybe before me. <clears throat> but I'll just ask her really my question quickly. Thank you. This is great work. Um, has there been any thought around making these maps accessible for viewing on a mobile device? So for example, if a facility has a phone or a tablet, they can look at their, their, their data on a phone and potentially then walk around and geolocate where they're at compared to the map. Thanks. So from the grid three side, um, we haven't yet um, what we did do was because we weren't able to actually print all the facility maps, uh, we did make sure that we, uh, the hard copy maps are in, in an A0 format, so they're really, really big. Um, so we made sure that we did the, the catchment maps in an A0 format so that at least, um, you know, they could be printed and we optimized them for, for black and white printing um, so that at least they could be used at the facility level if they did want to print them out. Um, but we did not link that to any mapping service. Um, they could have pulled it up on their phone as a PDF. That's that's the extent at this point. But it could be done. And just to add, uh, the dashboard that uh, Chisenka Musuka showed developed uh, recently, uh, it's a, it, it's basically an alternative as well. Um, however, we're still working on mobile on, on making the dashboard mobile and uh, tablet friendly. So that's uh, the first uh, step for now. But we also did notice that there is in, in many rural areas when during the training, when we've tried to showcase the dashboards, uh, giving the low bandwidth, it was uh, becoming problematic in rural settings. Thank you all. I think uh, I'll take one more question from Girdari. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Uh, uh, thank you for showcasing some brilliant work. So uh, I have one question, you know, uh, some of the analysis which you have shown, I would, uh, you know, want to know how the local uh, health managers have been appreciative of the analysis because some of this analysis, you know, if you show them once, uh, because they are so familiar with the terrain, they already know, you know, which is the better immunization place. And this information remains static for a significant uh, 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 time frame. Uh, so, so uh, what's the because because it's not showing very dynamic data, you know, and some of these are planning level uh, 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 indicators or uh, tools. So, how on a day to day basis, some of these people are because they have local wisdom also are, uh, are responding to uh, the initiative, especially towards the, you know, the block or, you know, uh, lower to the lower to the area where the service is actually delivered. I know that at, at a policy level, it has, it has a great, uh, 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 you know, uh, use case, but uh, I, I'm very interested uh, in knowing what's the response of the uh, people who are nearer to the ground. Thank you very much. And great work. Uh, thank you. I will add a short comment, and then maybe uh, Ms. Banta can um, add. So we did uh, collect feedback from both the district staff as well as the health staff during the training. So we've distributed uh, survey forms asking for feedback, asking if any data was missing, 
if anything was inaccurate. And now we're actually working on updating the maps to include the optimized sites and to incorporate the feedback from the team. Uh, we, the kind of one of the primary feedbacks was that um, lack of additional points on the map, like the points of interest to help staff orient themselves. Uh, so this is a delicate balance of cartography uh, that we are working on now to kind of include more POIs, but at the same time not overcrowd the maps. Uh, we've also been conducting interviews with the nurses at health facilities who've been trained um, in the past week. Uh, so we are working on the, um, the process evaluation that can then be hopefully shared with this group as well. But um, Ms. Banda, do you have anything else to add in regards to feedback from, from the field? Um, no, nothing much to add, but just to mention that um, it's uh, some of the feedback that we received around also ensuring that we're also covering aspects of routine immunization that now has also fed into this other optimization process. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. So very lovely discussion. And uh, in the next uh, monthly meeting, we will have uh, less less introduction. So we'll, we'll, we'll hope for more uh, allowing for more uh, uh, constructive discussions. Uh, I'll just uh, leave one to hand over to Anna uh, for five minutes, a quick overview of uh, uh, a funding opportunity, which is relevant to the question that was raised also about how can country supports this. And, and just a note, this is presentation is probably more relevant to the WHO and UNICEF, WHO and UNICEF country office or people that is um, uh, in uh, part of the Gavi um, coordination mechanisms at country level, uh, as these grants are managed by the Ministry of Health and they're not necessarily open, uh, at least at this stage, to technical partners. So uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you, Coco. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being uh, in this community. Uh, so you already did my first introduction of this slide. Now you can pass to the next ones. I will go over the objectives and the funding guidelines for the CDS uh, on the third window. Um, so, uh, this window has three objectives that are list and that should be aligned with the WHO guidance on developing a national deployment and vaccination plan, then DDP. Uh, there'll be a bit more on the on that uh, on the last slide. Uh, so the, the first objective is to support acceleration of vaccination of high and highest risk population. Uh, this is something to keep in mind because it is the most critical public health priority. Identifying and reaching high and highest uh, risk populations for COVID-19 uh, by having a clear understanding of who they are, where they are found, and how many people in these groups exist, and also why they were not identified before. So countries are encouraged to prioritize people-centered delivery strategies to reach uh, this population. And the second uh, objective it is to uh, prioritize uh, delivery strategies for reaching adults. Countries should consider their context, coverage, and demand. Uh, in addition to providing vaccinations in routine health services, countries can implement uh, time-limited intermittent activities and campaigns. Um, and also there's a note on this that delivery of doses to children aged 11 years and under will not be uh, supported. Uh, as for the objective uh, three, uh, in planning for integration, um, a partial of full adoption of COVID-19 into national immunization programs, countries should consider integration as a continuum rather than all in uh, all or none approach. So countries are encouraged to prioritize activities for COVID-19 integration with routine immunization. Um, next slide, please. So there are um, mainly two channels, the funding uh, guidelines to uh, manage to, to Gavi. Uh, for the ANC 61 countries, the funding window is managed by Gavi. Uh, the lead application development needs to be 
always from the country uh, ministers of health with the support of the UNICEF and WHO. Um, that's also why we are here uh, showing. So the country offices of WHO and UNICEF can uh, give support. The application needs to be submitted latest by the 30 September, uh, but the funds can be sent uh, can be spent by the December uh, 2023. The guidance, application form, country envelopes, activities, uh, and overall process are available on the website of Gavi. Next slide, please. As for the UNICEF manage the CDS uh, for the AMC 31 countries, um, this window is managed by the UNICEF headquarters. Uh, as for the, the rest of the information is more or less the same, I'll go quickly on it. Uh, it's uh, led always by the Minister of Health with the support of UNICEF country offices. Application to be submitted by the 30th September uh, 2022, funds to be sent by December 2023. Again, guidance, application form, country envelopes, uh, overall timelines, overall process to be provided soon through the UNICEF country offices. Next slide. Thank you. So countries are encouraged to identify, uh, reach, monitor, measure, and advocate for COVID-19 immunization by using NVDP categories. And you can find in this list uh, some illustrative examples of innovative interventions that can be considered for the Gavi CDS funding. If you see within these examples, we have the digital micro planning and monitoring, including GIS threatening, and also the geo optimization of immunization service uh, locations. Um, a note uh, on this also that uh, the vaccine doses and related supplies are not eligible for uh, this funding. Um, and that's it from this side, just uh, want, we wanted to leave this on the group. Uh, and now Hoku will close it and give you also the contacts uh, from our side. Thank you very much for uh, being here with us. Over to you, Hopo. Thank you, Anna, for that quick overview. Um, uh, and thank you for all the participants. Uh, this takes us to the end of this uh, first uh, meeting of the community of practice. Um, uh, thank you to all the presenters and also uh, to our Dev Global colleagues for helping us set up and facilitate uh, the meeting. Um, uh, you can find here some contacts uh, and uh, to reach out to us and specifically if you are looking for uh, support uh, from the GS working group in terms of uh, contributing to the Gavi CDS. Uh, applications for some of the geospatial components. Uh, we do have a number of um, uh, resources uh, to support you, so please do reach out. Uh, and uh, please keep an eye out, everybody, for further communication on the next meeting, uh, which will be, I believe, around September uh, 29th. Um, thank you all and have a good rest of the day.